Hi, fans of High Quality Entertainment. We are back to do a album review and rating. Uh, and then is Chris, no, Marsha, you're, you're reviewing, I'm confused here already. The Explorers Club Grand Hotel. Okay, right. Steve's pick from last week. And the three of us, uh, Steve, Glenn, and I, are reviewing Dark by, uh, the band is called Dark, and the album is called Dark, Round the Edges from 1972. It's a psychedelic rock, progressive, acid rock album. <laughs> Which was put forth by Chris. Yes. Just in case anybody forgets. So I'll just say, I'll read this little thing about the album. Dark Round the Edges is the first album by British psychedelic rock band Dark, released in 1972. The original edition is considered to be a holy grail for record collectors. The album was originally released in an edition of 64 copies. And you don't have one of them, Glenn. Most copies were given away to family and close friends of the band, but some were sold. It is now considered to be one of the most valuable records with original copies having been, been sold for prices upwards of 6,000 pounds and 25,000 pounds, depending on the version. In 2016, it was listed as the 17th most valuable record of all time. <laughs> and Glenn's shaking his head. That's not a good sign, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so uh i think i'm curious what glenn i think i don't know i think glenn would actually really like this album because i'll review it first i really like the album chris i played it you know you have to you should play it at least three times i played it probably six or seven times and it was always an enjoyable listen uh the, the very start of the album wasn't I was kind of like, oh, this sounds kind of amateurish or whatever, right? The drums and everything. But then it, it got into like the guitar work, which is my favorite part of the album. It's all the guitar work. The vocals are kind of, they're, they're okay. Uh, kind of, you kind of get used to them after a bit. And I, I just enjoyed the whole album as a listen. And I would, I'd like it in my, you know, not, not that I'm going to rush out to buy it, but I, I would like it in my CD, not the vinyl version for millions of dollars, but the CD version. I, I was very impressed with it. I would give it a solid eight out of 10. Okay, Glenn, start bashing up. You, are right. <laughs> you want me to go next? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, I was struck by one word that you said there, Larry, when you first started, amateurish. I wrote it down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um the first my i uh when i first heard it the uh, that's when i liked it the most through the first listen and then at the by the end of the second listen the first thought that came to my head is why didn't i pick eddie vetter <laughs> <laughs> so um it is a, a psych rock band rock trio um the guitarist loves his freaking fuzz oh does his wah -wah pedal. it's freaking like it's like somebody gave some kid a wah, wah pedal for his birthday or for christmas and he just couldn't stop play, playing with it like it's just after a while i think it's it it's overbearing um i think his playing is really like Larry said, amateurish. I don't think he's a very good guitar player. I think he hides it. I think he hides his guitar skills with the pedals and the effects. And uh, I don't think he does anything really adventurous. And there are times when it kind of starts to get really interesting. And then I go, oh, good. He's going to take it in this direction, maybe get a bit jazzy or maybe just add something in it to make it different than just playing pentatonic scales over and over again and um and he never goes there so then i get disappointed um i think the vocalist there was a couple of songs when i first heard the first track and a track called rc8 
did they ever remind me of the first Jethro Tull album in a in a way? Not the sound of the guitar or anything, but the vocal inflections. I thought it sounded a bit on the bluesy side. I thought they kind of sounded like some stuff off of that Jethro Tull. This was like. And um, yeah, uh, overall, uh, I think the vocalist, is, like Larry mentioned, he's he's a bit weak. Like he he doesn't have a strong voice. Like when he starts going oh or something like that, you can really hear he's really struggling to make that work. And um, uh, yeah, I, I the more I listened, the more I felt it was uh, kind of just three guys in their garage bash in a way like. Uh, and uh, I give it a 5.5 5 out of 10. So, so your, your favorite part of the album was the toilet flushing in the one song. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was me actually. That was a sign, right? Glad yeah, was me flushing my own toilet to dry, 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 dry out the sound. Yeah, but anyway, kind of yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I just found it was like amateurish, yeah. I think was a perfect word to describe, describe it. <clears throat> Tell right. them, Steve. Okay. Um, I have fuzz guitar. It is my first note. I mean, yeah, this guy, he just loves the fuzz guitar. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is of its time. But for six songs, for 45 minutes, that, that's too much fuzz guitar. So first first song, Dark Side. I was kind of surprised. He mentions Dark Side of the Moon. Now, this yeah. came out before Dark Side of the Moon. Um, but I'm going to say overall, this whole album, it's more... To me, it's more blues based than it is prog. I hear a lot like it's like you're hearing that early toll blues is what you're talking about, Glenn. And that's kind of the same thing. I, I thought uh, the second song, Maypole, that has a real jangly guitar for prog. Um, I mean, even though it does have the overriding fuzz. Third song, uh, Live for Today, you've got that drum and a uh, bass breakdown. It goes into a real kind of trippy, psyche. Uh, sound which is fine i love that kind of music you mentioned rch yeah and this is where they're really jamming and then it stops you get the toilet flush and then they pick it back up and you get the one clang on the cowbell the ding, and they go right back into the jam again <clears throat> and um then the cat that's the fifth song that's probably the most straight ahead uh rock song they do and then the final one, Zero Time, that is probably my favorite song on the album. Um, you know, it was interesting looking them up because, like I said in the email, the initial run of this was 64 copies, you know. I'm sure they're all kicking themselves and wish they had kept a couple for, for themselves. But uh, they'd be very well off, had they? I don't know if you saw, but these guys reunited in the 90s. If you, you can find a YouTube video for it. And so I gave it a 6.5. Okay. Marsha, your turn. Okay. So I had Steve's choice last week, which was uh, the Explorers Club Grand Hotel. And going through some of the comments from last week's video, uh, Stephen Schnee had said the album sounds like the Beach Boys on the A&M label, and that is a dead-on description of what that album is. It 100% he's right on that. And he does that show, The Ski Lodge, on mm -hmm. Tuesdays where he does like these softer pop hits of the 60s and 70s. And any one of those songs off that Explorers Club album, he could slip into that program. And I don't think anybody would know that it's a more recent release. Um, it's definitely a throwback. Um, I really liked the instrumentation. I thought some of the lead vocals were a little bit on the weaker side, but the harmonies were great. And um, there were a couple of a couple of songs on there that were a little too soft for me and i thought some of the um i just i lost my train of thought i'm sorry i thought some of the sequencing was a little bit odd um so the lead track is acapulco sunrise and then three quarters of the album it's Acapulco Sunset. I don't understand why that's not in the halfway point of the album. It just seemed a little odd to me. 
And I think the last track I've been waiting, or not, I've been waiting, excuse me, Open the Door is kind of weak. It's a weak closer. Um, the title track, Grand Hotel, though, is fantastic. That is an awesome song. And it goes into uh, Go For You and the way that those two blend together and the way uh, Grand Hotel leads in to go for you is awesome. That's definitely the highlight of it. So overall, I give this a six, but I'm a tough grader. So you are. I would say uh, if I came across this in a UCD bin and it was under five bucks, I would definitely pick it up. So it gets a six. It's a it's a feeling all right. I made. I made. All right, all right, on. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> We're feeling all right. I got. It. You're gonna have to send us all your little. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right now, we need those. You need those. That's awesome. So, it, so is a ten stairway to heaven? No, a ten is nobody does it better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're talking about Ween? <laughs> nobody does it better. That's uh. Who's that? Carly Simon. It's from yeah. the oh, James Bond yeah. movie. Yeah. His wife James loves Bond. me. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, what do you have to say? You have nothing to say. Well, I I I did the the Eddie Vedder album. Yeah, he picked Eddie oh, Vedder. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, I listened to it multiple times. Um, something that I always appreciate out of a lot of the people that were musicians that came out of that whole early '90s scene. Um, and Eddie Vedder obviously was one of the main ones, is they sort of have like one foot in classic rock and the other foot in punk. And it develops the way they sound because their influences, they can go either way. I always felt that Pearl Jam was more, they kind of went more classic rock and like a Nirvana went more punk. But they were obviously both influenced by both. So what I kind of liked with this particular CD is that the songs are songs. Like like what a, maybe a classic rock type of a song or you know and I wouldn't necessarily label it that but but the songs are songs but they have that punk rock aesthetic of being like less than two minutes long so you like jump from song to song really really easily I don't know if that had something to do with because of the fact it was a soundtrack maybe they were placed in the movie like that but to me it's very punk rock <laughs> to have this really great song and it just ends which doesn't bother me. You know, it, it actually, it packed a lot of really good material in a really short period of time. So it was, you mentioned it when you, when you brought it up, Marsha, it was a very easy listen. It was, it was a very easy listen to, to, to listen to and listen to again and listen to again. I didn't realize necessarily how much perhaps the uh, songwriting of Eddie Vedder probably went into Pearl Jam until I heard this because there's a lot of creativity going on, assuming that this is just the one person who made this soundtrack. So I'm going to say eight out of 10. Wow. I'm going to say that. And I am not, I'm not a tough grader. I go the other, <laughs> I go the other way, but at the same, you know, to me, I have to really not like something to probably go in the other direction because, you know, but 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 ultimately, I I I thought it was great. I thought it was great. And and again, I love picking up on the nuances of you can you can hear his his influences clearly, but it still sounds like like him as an individual. So so I liked it. I liked it. That was is it, that is was it a more album. acoustic or electric album? It, a little bit of both. Yeah, a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, it was it was. Uh, all I have to say is that the, they were they were not jams; they were songs, mm -hmm. just really, really a lot of times short songs, like punk rock, like punk, but but with the aesthetic of it being, you know, more more melodic and and like more melodic than punk rock usually is. Hmm. And what are your overall thoughts about our reviews of Dark? I'm fine. I. Yeah. If I made the album, I'd be really sad, <laughs> but I didn't. I just just put it out there. Yeah, I love finding records yeah. that like that where it's like, wow, I've never heard that before. Yeah, I've got yeah. a stack of them over here that I can't wait to share over time. Yeah. Um, but but no, I get it. I, it took me a while. I, I think that part of 
the appeal to it for me was that, wow, this is something I'm not hearing 15 times in a row on a radio. You know what I mean? This is something I'm, it's, it's new. It's not something that I, I hear all the time. So in, in that sense, it had that going for it for me before I even dropped the needle on it. Right. But, but at the same time, I agree with basically everything that, that, that everybody said, you know, it is a product of its time. And yeah. I love that time so much that I probably am willing to overlook stuff, you know, but uh, especially vocally, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, he's, it, it's a great overall listen to me to just kind of have on in the background. It sounds great, but you know, it's, it's, it's not a masterpiece necessarily. Yeah. So, so I'm on board. I think that's all reasonable. Cool. Okay. Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit of what you do with your podcasts? Oh, sure. No, I, I, I basically pick a subject that's a psychological subject. I love psychology. And um, sometimes it's things I'm interested in. Sometimes it's things I got to work out. Sometimes it's things I just love to, you know, read about. And what I'll do to illustrate what these different things mean is I'll illustrate them from pop culture sources. So in other words, if, if, if a record has a certain feel to it that really, really feels like the subject I'm talking about, we go over that record. Or the same thing with if it's a television show or if it's a film or whatever the case may be. Um, that's pretty much what we do. It's, it's a really great kind of a thing because you're learning something and what you're using kind of as your touchstones to learn are things that we probably all know because they're in pop culture. Mm -hmm. I also review records as well. Um, it, there's a, a series called Psychology on Vinyl. And what I do with each one of those records is kind of dig into you know, what it seems like psych psychologically the artist may have been going through when they recorded various records and so forth. And then the last thing I'll say is each episode has a playlist. I'm a child of the eighties. I made mixtapes and yeah, it's still yeah. in my blood. So at the end of every single one of the episodes, I'll pick 10 songs that you can look at at Spotify and listen to that kind of go along with the theme of the episode. So I hope that surmised it pretty well, but that's what we are. We're refresher, the pop culture therapy podcast. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I'll have the link below. Glenn Kellaway from The Basement. Tell us about your channel. Uh, just general discussion on um, pretty all, all various kinds of music. I like all genres of music pretty much and uh, talk about new stuff coming in and new stuff going out. And I love uh, when people comment and going back and forth and sharing passion for music. Really, it's as simple as that. And Marsha? I don't make um, videos very often and basically, you know, I do some contests, I do some threads, I just basically show what I've picked up. But again, I don't make a ton of videos primarily anymore. It seems like I just joined Steve on the live streams every other Sunday, which we've got one now this or today. Uh, yep. So please check it out. Um, and I would like to say that both Glenn and Steve's channels are very good. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I apologize, but we've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because Marsha didn't include you when she said two very good channels? Well, I, we're on Larry's channel, so of course Larry's channel is good. All right. Well, pretty much did all what Because we're on it. <laughs> exactly. Other than that, when we're not on it, it's not very good. No, no. No, Larry's channel is good because he recognizes talent. <laughs> Touche, Marsha. Yeah, my channel, pretty much same thing Glenn said. Um, do the live stream every other Sunday night with Marsha and Trevor. Some weeks we have a guest, some weeks we don't. Tonight we do not. Tonight we're doing what? Oh, uh, Bad, line, bad lyrics, good lyrics, and favorite uh, concept albums. So, yes, cool. and the Stop bad lyrics. Again. I'm so looking forward to doing bad lyrics. Well, there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> I know, and there, most of them crack me up. So Ooh. it's going to be a fun episode. Okay. So I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. We'll Thank you. See you all next week. Please remember to leave a comment below and uh, subscribe to everybody here. And uh, thank you. <laughs>
Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Leave studio.